okay uh, good morning all uh, so we are starting the first session of efcs 2021 all are welcome to this session the first session is um, handled by on uh, professor satyamurthy and also professor p pradeep uh, the first speaker is professor n satyamurthy who is uh, as all, all of us know he was the founder president of uh, founder director aisar mohali and we in the field of chemistry we all know that the the strength of mohali is uh, really known to all of us we, and therefore you know the uh, the effort uh, professor satyamurthy has taken uh, to bring up the institute to this level which is the best best teacher in the country professor satyamurthy is uh, is an eminent scientist he has uh, taken his phd from okalam state university uk and his area of uh, he has uh, he is the recipient of so many awards like batnagar award cv raman award fcci award and he was a uh, honorary professor in dncsr bangalore he is uh, he has also got the teacher award of andhra pradesh academy of sciences in 2003 he is he was selected as fellow of third world academy of sciences italy in 2005 and he was selected as jc bose fellow by dst new delhi in 2006 and he is a, a member of the editorial boards of so many international and acclaimed journals and his area of research is theoretical and computational chemistry uh, his main focus of research is chemical dynamics electronic structure of atomic and molecular clusters symmetry and pattern formation in flowers he is uh, now going to talk us on the beginning of chemistry sir professor satyamurthy sir good morning can you hear me okay yes we can yeah wonderful i want to thank Pradeep and the organizers for asking me to give this talk. I noticed that the emphasis on the talk is emerging trends in chemical sciences. Uh, when you talk about the emerging trends, is it quite appropriate to talk about the beginning of chemistry, uh, particularly in the early universe? and you will see why it is important and how it is an active field of research at this point in time uh how i need to find out yes i have got it here let me get the pointer yeah uh before i get into the uh, works i would like to thank my colleagues some of them are long time collaborators uh some of them are presently collaborators and of course i have benefited immensely with the work of my students at iit kanpur and aisar mohali over a period of time uh in the talk i would like to give a little bit of a background of astrophysics before astrochemistry started and in the beginning strangely strangely for a chemist it was a helium atom that was formed and interestingly helium atom which is considered rare and considered inert considered noble was the one to form the first chemical bond to the extent that we can gather from first principles 
and from available evidence normally we think of h2 molecule which is present in large quantities in interstellar media and various uh, planetary uh, nebulae conditions but it turns out it is not so easy to make h2 we will see how as we go along and these two species played a very important role in the beginning this h3 plus formation seems to be clearly established there are question marks on the formation of helium h2 plus in interstellar media one of the reactions that is important in among the species that were formed in the early universe is one of is this reaction here the helium colliding with h2 plus as a matter of fact the reverse reaction has uh, seems to have played a very important role in forming h2 plus which formed an impart played an important role in forming h2 that was not necessarily the most efficient mechanism for formation of h2 but it was one of the pathways until this point people have studied mostly reactions in the ground electronic state using what are called adiabatic potential energy surfaces but it turns out the non adiabatic coupling what they are we will see as we go along seem to play a very important role i will not get into the technical details for this collective audience but would like to give an idea what non adiabatic coupling is and how it is important in controlling or in deciding chemical reactions for the benefit of particularly the young audience i would give a summary towards the end now to understand and appreciate what i am trying to say in this talk we must look at the model of the universe how it originated and what is called the standard model which to a large extent accepted not necessarily 100% uh for the students i would say and the college teachers i would say if you would like to get started there is a wonderful series of articles by an authority on the subject professor jayant narlika a series of six articles the first one was labeled origin with a question mark of the universe it gives a very nice and simple introduction i benefited a lot in reading those six articles i would like to just some of the recap some of the essentials one of them is that the universe is expanding but the beauty is wherever you are in the universe the rest of the universe is expanding with respect to you and this is uh, reflected in the cosmological principle that as the galaxies recede away from each other in the expanding universe any galaxy relative to any other is the the recession speed is proportional to the distance the larger the distance the greater is the speed with which that galaxy is moving away and hubble gave a quantitative relationship between the speed and the distance and it gives you an idea of the age of the universe <coughs> based on various factors right now it is understood and accepted that our universe is 13.77 billion years old while our mother earth is less than half that age and this seems to be based on solid grounds <coughs> based on radio radioactive decay measurements but you know in science there is nothing like a solid ground <coughs> as time changes the solid ground can change too now how do we know all these things we know from observational evidence the stars and galaxies are moving away from us earlier <coughs> almost almost 100 years ago 
Meghna Saha from India came up with the Saha equation to decipher the temperature of the stars from the colors or from the emission that was taking place from the stars. For example, we know that the sun emits white light. And from that, we can gather the surface temperature of the sun. Even on that, there are dark lines, which are named after Fraunhofer, that give you an idea of the elements present. I am neither competent nor we have the time to talk about the details of astrophysics. But what I would like to emphasize is that we seem to know very clearly that since the universe is expanding, if you go back in time, the universe must be would be would have contracted. We will not get into the definition of time. We will not get into the reversibility of time or irreversibility of time. But we would say that you could imagine if the universe is expanding at one stage, it must have started off as a point at what one at a point. There was a time then one could say, George Gamow, well, we will not get into his belief or not belief in, in Bible, but he quotes from the Bible that let there be light and there was light. He goes on to define what is creativity. Creation means making something out of something which has no shape. We all, as good children, we grow up taking a, a ball of clay and making whatever we wish to make. So we play the role of the creator for the object that we create. So that is the schematic representation of the expanding universe downloaded from Wikipedia. You can find out for yourself. And this expansion, it is an adiabatic expansion. Therefore, it is accompanied by cooling. From the time T0, whatever the, the way you choose your time T0, for the first minute, three minutes, there was only expansion. And there was a dropping of the temperature. It came to about a billion Kelvin. I mentioned Weinberg's book. Weinberg passed away only a few weeks or a few months, yeah, a few months ago. In his book on the first three minutes, he describes what happened there. But we can say that was all physics. <coughs> and much of the evidence for all that comes from various observations. And those observations and interpretations have been recognized by the Nobel Committee, by Nobel Prizes at various time intervals. Today, we understand the universe continues to expand and that there is a background temperature, which is 2.736 Kelvin. Why is this 2.73 Kelvin important? If you look at where we are, and if we believe that in way past in time, the universe was small, you can have a relationship between what is called the redshift and the size of the universe. And you can relate it to the temperature at any point for which you can define a value of z or z, or z then you can come up with a temperature like a 3000 Kelvin where important chemistry began from what we understand. We can look at the number density. Today, the number density is very small, but at one time, it was not that small. It is not as dense as our atmosphere is, but much less, but even more than what we obtain as an average number density of hydrogen atoms in the universe at this point in time. <clears throat> chemistry, as I said in the beginning, strangely began with the helium atom. How did that happen? Very simple from what we understand. In the beginning, <clears throat> there was a stage you could not distinguish between light and matter. And then there was a stage several thousand or millions of years later. In the beginning, you had
you had protons the fundamental particles protons neutrons and alpha particles it turns out the alpha particle can easily grab an electron and become a helium plus and that is highly exothermic and the helium plus can absorb another electron become a neutral helium atom you can have you could have had lithium 3 plus go to lithium 2 plus lithium 2 plus go to lithium plus but lithium was present something like 10 orders of magnitude less in quantity than helium and helium was 1/10 of the number of protons available at that point in time so considering the number and the energy released it is believed that it is alpha particles which became helium neutral in the very early stage followed by a proton absorbing an electron well one doesn't call it an elect absorbing but calls it a recombination <coughs> to form a hydrogen atom and this tiny mini bit lithium plus 10 orders of magnitude less recombines with electrons to form lithium atom so that is the kind of a composition we had at a situation where the temperature was somewhat friendly and that was the right condition for the beginning of the chemistry what we call chemistry and that little dot shows you the beginning of the formation of helium atom and that was followed by the formation of hydrogen atom <coughs> almost concomitantly lithium in very small quantities began to be formed so the beginning of the universe or what matters to the chemist <coughs> there are only three elements in the periodic table and mendeleev had no work at all mendeleev had to wait for many more elements to be formed before he could think of his periodic table how were the other elements made that is a different a uh, level of understanding or uh, how the stars were formed subsequently and how the elements were formed but we will not get into it because that is not important for us for us all we know is that in the beginning of chemistry there were helium atoms there were protons and naturally what is considered non reactive readily combined with the proton and formed a helium h plus there was a lot of discussion on this formation this proposal was made only as recent as 2002 and for a long time they were looking for this molecule in the universe or the remnants of the universe only recently 2019 that tells you that we are still in the emerging trends it was discovered the existence evidence for the existence of helium h plus was obtained from the planetary nebula labeled ngc 7027 but it turns out ironically in this planetary nebula it was not this mechanism that was responsible <coughs> but this mechanism where helium plus <coughs> combining with a hydrogen atom forming helium h plus but remember this planetary nebula a very short, very recent <clears throat> they are very young when compared to the age of the universe but the possibility of helium h plus formation was realized as early as 1925 <clears throat> in a mass spectrograph i will show you the first recording of helium h plus in the laboratory and the understanding is that the helium h plus can combine with a hydrogen atom to give you h2 plus and the h2 plus can undergo charge transfer to give you h2 <coughs> so that is the sequence of species formed <coughs> so one can talk about this auto catalysis or a chain reaction <coughs> which must have been explosive at that point in time we do not have time to look at the details or rates of these processes 
This is just a picture from Wikipedia of how the planetary nebula NGC 7027 looks like. And it is only 600 years old. So you can see how young it is. And it is very small in the scale of the universe. And that is the Orion Nebula, <coughs> which contains plenty of hydrogen molecule. That is the first spectral, mass spectral evidence for the formation of helium H plus and helium H2 plus in the laboratory almost 100 years ago. Now, here I must mention the formation of <coughs> H2 molecule. If you look back in 1951, the thinking was the hydrogen atom and proton came together for H to form H2 plus. <coughs> very low radiative association, very small probability. But when you consider the age of the universe, small probability, small rate have no meaning because when you wait sufficiently long, everything becomes meaningful. But early suggestion was made by Chandrasekhar, another contribution from this country, where he proposed the formation of H minus. And then it was suggested that the H minus could combine with the H, form H2 minus and give H2 neutral. <coughs> it turns out this is much faster than a radiative attachment. And it is much faster than the charge transfer processes. So in all likelihood, while the helium H plus would have gone about forming some amount of H2, this route seems to have played an important role <coughs> in the formation of H2. I remember in my early days, I used to learn, I used to teach that two hydrogen atoms would come together and form a hydrogen molecule. But it is not that simple because they have no charges, no dipole emission. <coughs> Quadrupole emission is possible. The probability is very small. But remember, in the beginning of the universe, there was no third body. There was no dust. There was no metal surface. So one had to wait for radiative processes and some amount of two body collisions. Here is an illustration of the potential energy curve <coughs> for H2 and H2 minus. And you can see <coughs> if you could form H minus, it can readily combine with the H and form H2 minus. But when it reaches this distance, when they come close and reaches that distance, H2 minus is no longer stable, H2 is stable. <coughs> This simple mechanism, the curve that we have, have shown here, it took three years for my student to generate with the help of Professor Verandas from Portugal, and we published it about 10 years ago. Now, this problem, the rate of formation of H2 minus still remains to be known completely. And there has been some experiments <coughs> which were done to look at the process, to understand the reverse process, to look at the detachment of electron. And it turns out there is certain oscillations in the rate till this, this was published in 2015, that remains to be understood. What the author, the experimentally said was, it must be the leaving electron must be feeling the magnetic moment of the hydrogen molecule, which is rotating. But it remains to be established whether that mechanism is right or not. But this is an illustration of the experiment was carried out. And that is the illustration of <coughs> how the process takes place. You don't form H2 minus in the ground rotational state. You form it in J equal to 26. If the molecule as it rotates, the two species coming together at large orbital angular momentum and H2 minus, which is rotating, strangely <coughs> gives the system the stability. This is like you are in a carousel going around in circles. And as long as you are in going around in circles, you are in a stable situation. It is not an equilibrium. It is a meta state, meta stable equilibrium. But 
it is enough to form in the laboratory and to do experiments with it. As I said a little while ago, H and H2 plus could form H3 plus and emit light. And this species is known to exist in the interstellar media. An alternative mechanism is helium H plus could combine with H2, could collide with H2 and form this another way of forming H3 plus. Right now, we are looking at the energy transfer between these two processes, and that work remains to be published. Hopefully, early 2022, we'll be able to publish that. Now, last year, with my friend Michael Bayer and Satrajit Adhikari, we wrote a paper proposing that these three species could come together and form helium H2+. It takes place through what is a non-adiabatic route. Hopefully, we will have time to talk about it before the end of the lecture. As I said, this was detected in the laboratory as early as 1925. While the referees gave us very difficult time in publishing this paper, they do acknowledge <coughs> that it could be formed and it could be located in the interstellar media, although the mechanism of formation is still debatable. That is the mass spectral evidence for formation in the laboratory. And that gives you the idea of molecular abundance H2 molecule. Helium H plus is relatively less in today's condition. <coughs> but you can go back in time and you could see how in the beginning helium H plus was present more than H2 at one time. You have back, go back in time when you go left uh, towards the left of this axis here. Now, we had done <coughs> some work <coughs> over a period of four decades. I will give you the highlights of the work. This is the potential energy surface for the system. And what you see here is the potential energy surface on the vertical axis. This is where the reactants are. They form a helium H2 plus complex and they come out as a helium H plus. As I said in the beginning of the talk, the reverse process seems to have played a very important role in the early part of the universe. Now, when we were doing the dynamics in the late 70s and early 80s, we were struck that we could run a family of trajectories, a helium and H2 plus could come together and go back non-reactive or sometimes go as reactive. But there were conditions under which the trajectories were very complicated. We didn't know that at that time that these were to be called the chaotic trajectories, which we analyzed in later years <clears throat> as the field of chaos and fractals came up. We analyzed and confirmed that these are indeed chaotic behaviors of the trajectories, which means helium H2 plus could live long enough to be detected in the laboratory. So one can study the problem from a quantum mechanical point of view. In classical mechanics, you treat particles, atoms as particles. You can solve classical equations of motion. But in the quantum mechanical world, you treat them as a wave packet, which means a superposition of waves. And it evolves in time and space. And if you follow the wave packet, you can follow the uh, dynamics. It consists of three simple steps. <coughs> Initiation, wherever you start, propagation in time, and the final analysis, that's all to it. <coughs> These are mathematical equations we will skip for lack of time. And graphi graphically illustrate this is done by Sujita, who came from Kerala uh, several years ago, 2007, and carried out a lot of work for a period of four or five years and published in 2012. Here is a representation of the potential energy surface in three dimensions and in two dimensions. <clears throat> and we are going to watch the wave packet move from the reactants to an intermediate and come out as products in the next couple of slides. What you see here as a peak <coughs> is a wave packet, superposition of waves. You go from the reactants 
to the intermediate and the wave packet evolves in time part of it will go into the products and part of it will come back into the reactants which means <coughs> every collision need not lead to products there is a certain probability about one third to one fourth one to one half of the collisions leading to product others are not successful this dynamics is simple for a collinear geometry if you want to study the dynamics in three dimensions you use a center of mass separation and you look the inter internuclear distance for the h2 plus and there is an angle between the two you solve the problem in three dimensions and time of course is a fourth dimension <coughs> we are in non relativistic conditions therefore we keep time and space as separable and it's a graphical tool of following the dynamics and by following the wave packet time evolution we arrive at the reaction probability we can convert the reaction probability into reaction cross section so cross section is a measure of the reaction probability we have calculated <coughs> for different initial vibration states you can have a threshold and the probability increases but you can for certain conditions you can increase in probability and after that it can go down also you can have an exchange process <coughs> you can have a dissociation process so both processes we were able to investigate this was the speciality of sujita's work where he she could deal with both dynamics <coughs> at the same time and then she compared her results with the experiments to confirm that she was on the right track and our predictions are verifiable experimentally she also looked at the effect of rotation qualitatively what you see is as you make the molecule rotationally hotter j equal to 0 going to j equal to 1 there is a drop in the probability but then it goes up again therefore there is an inhibition <coughs> followed by enhancement in the case of rotation so we have seen effect of translation that is initially the energy translation energy can help the reaction we have seen vibration it is helpful we have seen the effect of rotation <coughs> it can be sometimes helpful sometimes not helpful depending upon the initial rotational state of the molecule but all that is in the ground electronic state what if the atom and the molecule are electronically excited what you say here see here is a correlation diagram but it's called an adiabatic correlation diagram the picture is worth 1000 words they say this particular picture is probably worth 10000 words which means i can just keep this one slide and give an hour long lecture on the dynamics that takes place on this multi sheeted surface what is important for us is to emphasize that whatever we talked about is all in the ground state but if we excite either the helium atom or the hydrogen atom electronically and consider a set of electronically excited states if the states are the same symmetry <coughs> they would avoid each other in one dimension In other words, what is degenerate becomes non-degenerate. But if you go to higher dimensions, you can have what is called a conical intersection. I will show you an example of a conical intersection. And here is the ground state. The dark blue surface is the ground state on which we have spent a lot of time, a lot of years, looking at the dynamics. But as you go to the excited state. <coughs> the first excited state and the second excited state they come very close to each other and there is a conical intersection a sideways view that is a conical intersection you move away from this point in another dimension they the surfaces do not cross 
what it means is that you can have a dynamics on this higher excited state and part of it can leak through and come out like this so very lot interesting dynamics we are in the process of investigating dynamics <coughs> on this excited state with the help of my friend satrajit adhikari in indian association for the cultivation of science at kolkata along with michael bayer who is a pioneer in the field of non adiabatic interaction those of you are interested in the details <coughs> of the non adiabaticity i would like to say that <coughs> the normal xi equal to esi is the equation that you see for an adiabatic process when you want to go to the when the the two electronic states become degenerate then the von apennemer approximation breaks down normally when you say the atoms and molecules when they fly at very high velocities the von apennemer approximation breaks down it also breaks down when the there is a degeneracy <laughs> two or more adiabatic potential energy surfaces are close to each other and the non adiabatic effects become significant <clears throat> so what really one needs to do if you want to understand the processes that take place under high energy conditions are up in uh, in the in the universe or early in the universe under high energy conditions you must include non adiabatic aspects of the dynamics the the adiabatic schrodinger equation <coughs> gets some additional coupling terms here <coughs> these are called non adiabatic coupling terms that's a first order term and that's a second order term what is important for us is to qualitatively understand we will show in the next slide when two electronic states become degenerate that is two electronic states k and j become they are close in energy when the denominator become zero you can see there is a singularity the non adiabatic coupling term can become singular and that is when you get a conical intersection there are ways and means of locating these conical intersections here is a graphical illustration of a helium atom coming towards h2 plus and we are trying to locate the conical uh, intersection the, the location of the ci in the three three atom uh, system we have done the diagnostics <coughs> and located the non adiabatic coupling terms for a diatomic system it still remains finite for a triatomic system they can become completely singular what it also means is that when you go around a conical intersection there is a phase factor called a geometric phase it can become pi or it can become multiples of pi that requires a larger discussion we will not we don't have time and that shows you how in one dimension the two states touch each other and there is one and this is a conical intersection between the first excited state and the second first excited and the second excited state or if you call this one the ground electronic the second and the third have an avoided crossing here in one dimension and a conical intersection in higher dimension these are further graphical illustrations of the same idea so what do i want to say in summing up that the elementary chemical reactions between helium atom a proton to give helium h plus and helium h plus combine reacting with other species it's not so elementary there is lot of uh, physics that underlies one talks in terms of potential energy surfaces for the ground electronic state and for the excited states and whenever the excited states become degenerate there is a lot of non adiabatic coupling terms <clears throat> that have to be taken into account if you want to describe the dynamics accurately accurately full stop and with that i would like to say that i hope you got an idea of the nuances involved 
in studying some elementary or what are called elementary chemical reactions thank you very nice i i i am sort of going to ask one the first question just to yeah. uh, initiate if um, there are other thoughts <coughs> um, there are a large number of students and you talked about uh, the beginning of beginnings of chemistry and say if you were to look at a chronological list of chemical reactions if you write the chemical history what would one write as the first arrow what would be the next arrow indicating chemical reactions can you please comment on this yeah see by definition a chemical reaction must involve either a bond formation or a bond uh, breaking or of course a combination of both of them so if you look at it that way the first chemical bond formed in the early universe was between helium atom and a proton that one covalent bond between the neutral helium and a proton a two electron bond was perhaps the first chemical bond to be formed and the rest of it of course followed yeah that would be the first chemical reaction because here you have a neutral atom and we have a proton and the first chemical bond formed in the early universe it would give a time for it correct yes hello any other any other questions two minutes uh, question please any other queries participants <coughs> i noticed that uh, this uh, 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 this lectures are recorded pradeep are they yes they are recorded yes, yes, yes. they are uh, therefore the students who feel shy in asking questions can go back and look at them of yes, course these yes. days they have so much to look in the youtube <coughs> if yes, they are interested they can always look at it yes, and they can yes, always yes. write to me i had given my email address in the very first uh, slide if i remember right okay so we are uh, running uh, yeah that is my email address there hello hello yeah uh, professor uh, sukuda has a question uh, professor sukuda is uh, asking this question from tokyo university yeah. nice seeing you tatsuya let me unmute I didn't get that. Could you try again? You need to unmute that, sir. Okay, let me see what is going on. Ah, sorry, sorry, I can't yeah. unmute. So, uh, thank you very much for the nice talk. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, I'm wondering uh, whether uh, the tunneling process is. involved in this kind of elementary reactions i don't know the temperature of the reaction environment so maybe okay. the temperature must be very low so tunneling yeah. process it's may, a it's may a happen. very very important question i'm glad you asked the the beginning of the, the what is called the chemical epoch which was friendly for chemical bond formation <clears throat> was about 3000 to 4000 kelvin in this system helium h2 plus in the electronically excited state uh in the ground electronic state helium h plus colliding with the hydrogen giving helium and h2 plus has zero barrier therefore there is no question of tunneling however if you go to the first electronic excited state and the second electronic excited state there is an avoided crossing and there is a huge barrier you would normally think a helium plus and the h2 can come together and readily form helium h plus it doesn't you would think the charge transfer would take place readily it doesn't 
it likes to go to what is called a dissociative charge transfer. The helium plus and the H2 give you helium neutral H and the H plus. That process <coughs> has a huge barrier and therefore one has to invoke a tunneling. The probability formation is small. One has to live with the tunneling. Of course, these days, People talk about cold atom chemistry. We are not talking about a Kelvin. We are talking about a milli Kelvin and micro Kelvin. And there the dynamics, of course, is completely uh, different. The helium atom and the H2 plus could come together and form a helium H2 plus. And it gets stuck there because to go anywhere else, it requires energy. So that is not going to happen. Uh, if all of you agree, uh, we shall Thank move you very to much. the next session. Okay. Uh, uh, let me uh, thank uh, Professor Satimurti for his uh, wonderful lecture and his uh, talk about the beginning of chemistry, the most intriguing things, early universe, start of the early universe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Please join me. All of you, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Satyamurthy for his wonderful lecture. Yeah, thank you. I just give me a minute. I have to find a way of uh, quitting. <coughs> I will. Uh, I will change. No yeah, please, please do that. Okay. Thanks, sir. Once again, thanks. Yeah, it's it's my pleasure. Yeah.